Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, presentation of the OECD FAO Agricultural Outlook. Uh, just a few words of housekeeping for those who are watching online. Uh, we have simultaneous interpretation available in French. You'll find that in the control panel. Uh, the session is being recorded, just so everyone knows that. Um, we're going to have a few presentations this morning, first from the OECD Secretary General, Matthias Korman, uh, followed by the Director General of the FAO, uh, Chu Dongyu. Uh, we'll have a second presentation on the outlook from Leanne Jackson of the OECD's Trade and Agriculture Directorate, and then we'll open up to your questions. For the media who are watching us online, if you'd like to start putting your questions now into the chat function, please feel free to do so. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And with that, I hand the floor over to the OECD Secretary General, Mr. Corman, please. Uh, Director General Q, uh, colleagues, uh, it's my great pleasure to launch this year Agricultural Outlook uh, with Director General Q Dong Yu. Uh, this is the 18th outlook produced uh, jointly between the OECD and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, thank you, Dong Yu, for your continued and highly valued partnership. Uh, our long-standing collaboration has helped us stay at the leading edge of the challenges facing the agricultural sector. The OECD FAO Agriculture Outlook is a global reference point for projections on key agricultural commodity markets. It looks at where existing trends in agricultural commodity and fish markets at national, regional and global levels are expected to take us over the next 10 years. And this year, the projections go to 2031, one year after the target for the Sustainable Development Goals. This year's projections are also published against the backdrop of a food security crisis caused by Russia's unprovoked, unjustifiable an illegal war of aggression against Ukraine. The war against Ukraine is first and foremost a humanitarian disaster for Ukraine, uh, destroying lives, homes and infrastructure with millions displaced within and beyond the country's borders. But the war also adds uncertainty to the global economic outlook, leading to lower growth and higher inflation, also driven by the significant implications for global agricultural production and supplies. Growing food insecurity and the high risk of extreme poverty and hunger across many countries as a result of the war against Ukraine, particularly in low-income countries, are a significant global concern. Food prices had been steadily rising since the mid-2020s. However, the Russian blockade in the Black Sea and the related export challenges for Ukrainian wheat has further exacerbated disruptions in food markets, pushing prices up by more. But these disruptions have also generated fear of shortages in price volatility, leading a number of countries to impose export bans or other restrictions. As a result, at their peak, wheat prices rose 60% above pre-war levels. And while prices have since settled somewhat, um, you know, obviously the outlook uh, is still uncertain. Uh, global wheat supply over the past 12 months was actually higher than over the previous 12 months. Global wheat production is projected to remain broadly stable or decline only slightly over the 2022-23 period. But the outlook remains marked by great uncertainty linked to both the implications of the war for wheat production as well as getting product to market into key markets around the world. <clears throat> Our projections suggest that in 2022-23, <clears throat> wheat prices could be 19% above pre-war levels if Ukraine fully loses its capacity to export, and 34% higher if, in addition, Russian exports uh, are also reduced by half. Uh, with food security already under pressure, consequences could be dire, particularly for the most vulnerable. Uh, one thing is clear, an, an immediate end of the war would be the best outcome all around. Uh, firstly, for the people in Russia and in Ukraine, but also for the many households around the world that are suffering from 
sharp price increases driven by the war. An immediate end of the war would have an immediate positive impact in terms of addressing the food security challenges facing the world. It would immediately improve the situation for the most vulnerable households around the world who depend on wheat as a staple crop and who suffer the most from the sharp increases in prices. In managing the impact of war on food security, let me briefly focus on three areas for attention and action. The first, we must ensure that markets remain open to trade and investment to the greatest extent possible. The disruptions from the war have further demonstrated the importance of trade in ensuring food security. It is Russia's war of aggression which has caused this threat to food security. However, we also need to be very clear about the fact that export bans or export restrictions make the bad food security situation it is causing even worse for the world's poorest. Export bans or export restrictions reduce the supply in the global market further and hence worsen food shortages and drive global prices up by more. We need to avoid these measures. Uh, to mitigate the impact of the war on food security and food prices, we need more trade, not less. We must maintain a well-functioning global trading system, ensuring that markets remain open and where goods can flow to where they are that are needed the most. We very much welcome the Geneva package of agreements reached at the recent 12th Ministerial Conference of the World Trade Organization, spanning a wide range of important decisions to improve the operation of global markets. Second, we also need to double down on our efforts to improve transparency of agricultural supplies. The OECD is working with global fora like the G20 to improve transparency, risk assessment and policy coordination. We also work with the FAO and other international organizations through tools like the Agricultural Market Information System, which was launched by G20 agricultural ministers in 2011. By providing a platform to coordinate policy action among major trading countries of agricultural commodities in times of market uncertainty, the Agricultural Market Information System has helped to prevent unexpected price hikes and strengthen global food security. Uh, finally, while addressing the immediate problems, we need to work towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement objectives on climate change. Uh, food systems are expected to provide food security and nutrition for a growing population, expected to approach 10 billion people by mid-century. In order to feed a growing global population while addressing the urgent climate crisis, the agricultural sector must manage to do more with less. The outlook finds that average agricultural productivity must increase by 28% over the next decade to meet Sustainable Development Goal 2 on zero hunger while keeping agricultural emissions on track for Paris Agreement targets. This is more than triple the productivity increase achieved over the past decade. The productivity growth is also of particular importance when we look at agriculture's role in the fight against climate change. Despite an expected fall in the carbon intensity of production, the sector is still projected to emit 6% more greenhouse gases in 2031 than it does today, moving further away from our Paris Agreement targets. Our diets contribute significantly to these trends. 90% of the increase in emissions is indeed going to come from livestock. But we can and we must take action to get ourselves back onto the right track to meet our sustainable development and climate goals. Above all, uh, concerted efforts are needed to step up productivity enhancing investment in infrastructure, innovation and human capital, all critical drivers of agricultural growth. Uh, our latest agricultural policy monitoring and evaluation report released last week shows that out of 817 billion dollars in total agricultural support subsidies that 54 uh, governments covered in this report spend each year, only 13% is directed to innovation, biosecurity or infrastructure. Almost half of the total agricultural subsidies distort competition 
and undermine the role of trade in our food systems, resulting in higher market prices are paid by consumers. This has to change. Higher shares of support have to go into better education and knowledge transfer activities for farmers, as well as addressing food waste and loss while increasing investments in innovation and infrastructure. The design and urgent implementation of policy solutions to build sustainable agriculture and food systems in a changing env environment will be high on the agenda of the OECD Agriculture Ministers' Meeting in November this year. Taking place just one week before COP27, it will be a timely opportunity to reaffirm commitments to make global agriculture more productive and sustainable. Uh, colleagues, in these challenging times, the partnership between the OECD and the Food and Agriculture Organization is stronger and more important than ever. Uh, the issues we face today cannot be tackled by any one country alone, and the OECD will continue to work with its partners across the globe uh, to help governments design, develop and deliver better agricultural and food policies for better lives, so together we can defeat hunger. Uh, thank you. Secretary General, thank you very much. We'll now pass the floor to Chu Dong Chu, the Director General of the FAO. Okay. Good morning, Secretary General of the OECD, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm now in the Lisbon. So, dear colleagues, I'm pleased to join my esteemed colleagues, uh, Secretary General of the OECD, to release the 2022 edition of our joint agriculture outlook report. I would also like to thank you and your staff for organizing the event this year. I hope that the conditions will allow us to host it physically in Rome next year and to welcome you to Roma headquarters of FS. Our two organizations have long understood the importance of evidence-based forward-looking and professional analysis for the effective decision-making by our members. Because you and FAO is the uh, uh, international professional specialized agency. FAO is under UN, uh, uh, intergovernment, and the OECD, of course, by name, it's of uh, members of OECD. This is now the 18th year of joint OECD FAO aircraft outlook. You know, we always say that you have to do our analysis so for one time, it's quite easy. But if we continue to do 18, huh, it's not so easy. We should appreciate all the colleagues who are uh, contributing during the past uh, 18 years uh, uh, for this outlook. The report has established itself as an excellent example how the OECD and FO collaborated on the work of a common interest to support our members. It is also show how international organizations can work together in our professional way with members to produce a complex publication that looks ahead to next 10 years. Our global simulation models are being used to assess the impact of a crisis the world are facing. Recent outlook and the scenario simulations have helped us to better understand the consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And now we are working closely to provide a critical assessment of the implication of the war in Ukraine on global agriculture market and food security, and also plus other uh, uh, passports of uh, uh, conflict and humanitarian uh, uh, issues. We are witnessing severe food, feed, fuel, fertilizer, price hog, shocks, given the importance of uh, 
uh, Russian Federation and Ukraine in this market. This price increase come on the top of already high prices caused by the strong global demand, supply constraints, inter disruption of the logistics, and the hike of price on the primary commodities, and also less investment during the past uh, uh, years. You know, after previous uh, to the security program is 2008. So in March 2022, the FL food price index reached a record high, and it was only decreased slightly since then. So it was a 160, yeah? all of you know that, now it's 157.4. So it's still very high compared to the, uh, three years ago. The Sarah's price index reached an all time high in May 2022. The solar food, feed, fertilizer, uh, and the fuel prices, as well as the tightening financial conditions, are uh, really increasing human suffering across the world. As I said the, uh, during the uh, G7 uh, ministerial conference, uh, 24 June, all those overlapping crises come together and make the situation so complicated, interconnected, and, and now the war in Ukraine it's additional to many conflict others around the world. So if we didn't to take the concrete action to support the global food production, food supply, and also food availability next year, 2023, of course, Russia and Ukraine is one of the major wheat for production export resources. And then 19 million additional people could face a chronic hunger. That's a real challenge for all of us, international communities. Yeah. And also, not only uh, wheat, and also look at the uh, challenge supply of the agriculture input, especially fertilizer, the seed, and the feed. So they will, in fact, the food supply of rice, corn, soybean, or even other uh, animal products. So that's really complex and comprehensive in implication on the food security in the coming months or even years. Time is short to prevent the worldwide food uh, uh, security crisis in 2023. As I said, the food uh, fertilizer affordability and the rising export uh, balance and restriction and worst in the middle term outlook for food and feed. And especially if we persist into the into the next planning season. You know, normally in the north part of the world, they start plant the wheat, wind wheat in uh, October. So you can imagine only three months. Eh? For a country, it's too short time. So it, it is, we hope the war can be stopped, peace can restore. And it's good for the for the peoples in Ukraine and Russia and others, and also for the global food production and the food supply. This year, it is an issue of accessibility because we had a good uh, production last year. But what is it for next year? We have to think in advance and design 
in advance. And that's an early warning, early prevention approach for a culture. And also it's very important for humanity development peace nexus. Dear colleagues, this year's report was produced during a period of unprecedented events. It is being released today in a time of high uncertainty. However, despite all the immediate challenges, OECD and FL generally agree on the need to keep the looking beyond the current crisis to guide our members onto the sustainable recovery path. The report provides a link between the current pandemic, the conflict, crisis, and medium-term trade and development in the global commodity market. That's why FAO, we had a successful five regional ministerial conference. On the one hand, we have to deal with the immediate actions deal with all the uh, conflict and the crisis. On the other hand, we have to look beyond uh, the, for the uh, transformation of the food system globally, and also uh, build back better and greener. And also, it's very important for us to look long-term and 2030 agenda on the development uh, sustainable development goals. We have to, you know, the integrate mid-term, long-term, with the immediate action. Keep the consistent supply, support the members how to deliver their uh, food on the ground, and also how to produce more and with less. So I think the production growth is expected to be driven by productivity gains. This improvement would not be sufficient to reduce the greenhouse gas emission from a culture of the next decade. That's why I said so many times we need to produce more and more quantity, more diversity, with less impact on the environment, and less input of natural resources. The solution, and uh, we, FAO, during the past three years, we started with endorse the FAO strategy framework for the next 10 years, last year by the minister conference. And this year, just the uh, last uh, two weeks ago, the FAO Council endorsed the two semantic strategies. One is on the climate chain, one is on the innovation and science. And these two semantic strategies also interlinked and work to be coherently and to address the challenges for the transformation of agriculture systems and rural development. That's what we are focused on to support the members transform our agriculture systems to be more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life for all, leaving no one behind. There is enough food energy and the resources globally, but the record high price makes the no incentive yeah, for, the, for the farmers to produce more. So that's why I'm uh, happy, pleased to see a lot of our uh, members are now working uh, efficiently to support the farmers, especially family farmers, to have an incentive to produce. Second, also, we are welcome to the WTO MC 12 ministry declaration to look at the all the trade issues to keep the international market open and also uh, that's not it. Yeah. What's wrong with it? Uh -huh. So I think that's very important for us to work together with uh, all the relevant uh, six agencies like WTO and others, and OECD, of course, uh, Secretary here, and to uh, keep the international trade open and more smooth also 
uh, very important for food security. And yesterday, we just launched the SOFA of FL. We hope we can work together more and better and in the coming years and have our members and the farmers and the consumers and innovation and science, innovation not only on the science and technology, innovation on the policy, as a Secretary uh, uh, General, you mentioned. Policy innovation in some of the startup point to change, to transform agrophysics. So let's work together and until accomplishment of our mission. Thank you. Director General, thank you very much for those remarks. I'm going to pass along now to Leanne Jackson from the OECD's Trade and Agriculture Directorate, who's going to present a few more of the uh, more detailed findings of uh, this year's outlook. Please don't forget, uh, media who are watching us, go ahead and put your questions into the chat function. Leanne, hand you the floor now. Great, thank you so much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us um, for this launch. As you've heard already, today we're looking at the OECD FAO Agricultural Outlook Report um, that we produce annually together. Um, this report has projections for major agricultural commodity markets looking ahead over the coming decade on consumption, production, prices, and trade. It draws on extensive expertise uh, at the OECD and the FAO, and you've heard already that we've been collaborating together on this for 18 years. So what I'd like to do is focus um, in my presentation on some of the key messages that we're drawing from this analysis, and also to highlight how agriculture can contribute to um, addressing some of the big global challenges we have with us today. So first, uh, let's take a look at the, what's been happening with consumption and diets. So on this slide, you can see the per capita availability of the main food groups in calories. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see the world um, average. And then on the right-hand side, you see the distribution based on income groups. So globally, um, average food availability per person um, is expected to increase by about 4% over the coming decade, and staples and animal products will account for about 70% of the, that increase. But of course, when you break it down by income groups, you can see that there's some variability across the income groups. Um, much of the increase will be due to population growth in low and middle income countries, um, which you can see from the middle bars on this slide. And then if we take a closer look at what's going on with the high income groups, you can see that there's very, um, very low consumption increase um, in and limited change in composition of diet. And this has to do with the fact that already the consumption levels in that um, group of countries is relatively high and, it, and they have aging populations, which means that there's a, more of a limit on the additional calorie requirements that those income groups have. On the other hand, if you look at the low-income group, which is on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, the average consumption for this group of countries is expected to increase by about 5%. Um, and here you can see that much of that increase is going to come from um, increased increase in staples. So more than half of the additional calories will come from increased consumption of staple products. Um, the higher cost of animal proteins and fruit and vegetables means that there'll be a small, only a small increase in dietary diversity. So we see in our projections a limited convergence in the composition of diets. Turning next to this issue of climate change and how agriculture production interacts with climate change, on this slide you can see the annual change in agricultural output and the direct greenhouse gas emissions um, comparing growth in agricultural production, which are the blue bars, with growth in greenhouse gas emissions per year, which are the green bars. Um, so here you can see um, the direct greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, as we heard in the introductory remarks, are it's expected to increase by 6%, and livestock is expected to account for about 90% of that increase. But what this slide shows is that ag emissions are growing more slowly, are expected to grow more slowly than production. 
Um, and this is due to both productivity improvements and some reduction in the share of ruminant production um, globally. But more effort is needed if we want agriculture to effectively contribute to global reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and to meet targets in the Paris Agreement. And these efforts could, for example, include adoption of climate smart production processes and technologies, especially in the livestock sector. So turning now to what our projections say about trade, globally trade, agricultural trade is expected to increase over the coming decade. Lots of this trade is going to happen within regions, but of course we also expect inter-regional trade to expand. So this slide represents net trade um, across three different time periods for different regions in the world. So the green bar represents the time period 2009 to 2011, the orange bar is more recent 2019 to 2021, and then the blue bar shows our projections of net trade, um, all of this measured in um, billions of US dollars, 20, 2014 to 2016 US dollars. So what you can see from this so slide is that some regions will export a growing share of their agricultural production, and these have, are traditional exporters, so you can see that includes Latin America and Europe, for example, while others who are traditionally ex-importers will be increasing their imports due to rapid population growth and or um, resource constraints, such as the availability of arable land. So in this group, you have sub-Saharan Africa, um, South and Southeast Asia. If you look at the far right of the slide, you can see the results for Southeast Asia. While Southeast Asia does um, have significant exports and imports, their net trade is relatively low because these two amounts are relatively similar. What our projections show is that in the coming decade, projected imports from this region will grow at a higher rate than exports due to strong demand growth. And these results have important, um, important meaning for our efforts to achieve food security, especially for resource-constrained countries where imports often account for a very high share of calorie and for protein. And this underscores some of the messages that we also have heard that we really need to make sure we're investing in a well-functioning, predictable trading system, especially for these people who are food insecure. So inflationary pressures on agriculture and food prices have been on everybody's mind recently. This slide shows uh, how the current situation fits into um, perspectives of trends in price, real prices over time. So you can see over the past half century, there's been really a declining uh, trend in real prices. And here this slide shows uh, real prices for um, various commodities, soybeans, wheat, maize, beef, and pork. Um, and of course, when you look at the slide, you can also see the historical deviation. So you can see that there was quite a large spike in the 1970s. You can also pick up the spike that occurred around 2008. But these spikes didn't alter the long-term declining trend. Um, if we look more recently at the 2020 and 2021 prices, you can see um, that there was, in fact, already inflationary pressure occurring in agricultural commodity markets um, due to tight global supplies, due to some extreme weather events, but also increased production and transport costs, which were related to the pandemic and to um, disruptions that occurred at that time. Our projections reflect an interplay between fundamental supply and demand factors under normal situations, and our projections show that this real price trend is expected to be flat or declining in the coming decade. Of course, there's many uncertainties um, around these projections related to war, related to climate, also to disease and consumer preferences, and of course, policy change can affect um, what the outcomes are actually. So finally, let me turn to the scenario um, that we undertook. So we wanted to have a look at how agriculture can contribute to solving multiple goals. And the key goals we were targeting were the looking at how agriculture can contribute to achieving zero hunger goals in the sustainable development goals, and also how agriculture can simultaneously contribute to reducing emissions. And we know that these can, at times, be working in opposite directions. Um, to, to address hunger, we need to increase production. 
um, to increase production without productivity growth, we might be increasing emissions. So we asked the question, how much productivity growth would we need if we wanted to do both of these things simultaneously? So on the zero hunger side, we looked at um, increasing average calories per person per day for low and middle income countries by 10% and increasing average calories per person per day in low income countries by 30% in order to reduce the prevalence of undernutrition. Um, and simultaneously, we um, looked at how to do that while reducing greenhouse gas emissions by about 6%. And what we found is that to reach these targets together, we would need to increase global agricultural productivity by 28% over the next decade. And this reflects um, a com combination of a 24% increase for crop productivity and a 31% increase in animal productivity. And these are quite large numbers. To put that in pers perspective, that 24% number for increased global crop productivity is more than three times what was achieved in the past decade. So let me just wrap up um, with some of the key messages. Uh, our projections so show that real food prices are projected to decline due to slower demand growth, which is also matched with more efficient production. This is good news for food affordability, but of course will also put pressure on farm incomes. Um, we see that yield improvements and a declining share of ruminant production in total agricultural output um, is good news for sustainability in agriculture, but more is needed. Um, and we also could see from this um, increasing specialization in trading patterns that uh, we really need to make sure that our trading system is well-functioning and predictable. This is increasingly important for food security, but it's also important for livelihoods um, in food exporting countries. And then the big, um, the big message that we'd like to draw out is that substantial acceleration in productivity growth is required if we want to achieve these big societal goals, um, including eliminating hunger and getting on track with our climate change objectives. Um, at the OECD, we recommend that uh, we look at boosting agriculture investment and innovation and enabling knowledge and technology transfer and skills transfer and also um, additional efforts could also help in relation to reducing food loss and waste and limiting excess calorie and protein intake. And with that, I'll conclude and pass it back to you, Larry. Thank you. Leanne, th thank you very much for that presentation. Congratulations both to you, the teams at the OECD and the FAO for this year's outlook. I'm um, gonna jump right into the questions and uh, the first one here, um, some people are asking, well, the report is arguing that a business as usual path is not an option. It, we won't make it to the zero hunger goal. We won't make it to the greenhouse gas emissions goals um, from agriculture. They won't decrease. So what needs to be done in order to change these paths and achieve these objectives? I said to me. I think it's a question for both uh, heads of organizations, if you'd like. Okay. Uh, I, I, yeah. Your, your sense? No? Okay. Now it's okay. Yes. Okay. Um, first and most, yeah? And both teams to understand what is the root cause of global food security crisis. And also, what is the future scenario? Because we are looking for 10 years, not for 10 months or, or 10 weeks. I remind all the both team eh, to think professionally and mutually and naturally. Otherwise, you make this one course as a comprehensive course. And they are misleading the, our, our customers. So I made a clear statement on 21st June. The increased challenge situation we are facing, number one is pandemic. Pandemic is not over. And the implication of pandemic is still there. Second, global interaction of supply chain and the rising cost of major primary commodities. I know that my colleague, he was a minister of uh, financial in Australia. Uh, 
you understand what is the uh, uh, primary commodities, yeah? Third is the war in Ukraine uh, and other top 10 conflict and the humanitarian crisis across the world. So, of course, and the climate change, climate crisis, uh, and that's also for the next 10 years, I didn't expect they will change it uh, much, even more or less uh, uh, of impact from the climate crisis. I said so many times, not only climate change, it's, and also next 10 years, another, it should be population increase, especially in Africa and other uh, developed nations. So all this, it will be makes our global scenario are very complicated and interlinked. That's real, real uncertainty. It's very challenging to, to FAO colleagues and for OECD colleagues and others. Second, I think we have to look at the, what is we should do now and what we should do future, little long term. So I started with the first long term FAO. We prepare it uh, and the uh, during the past uh, three years, what is the new strategy framework of FAO? I don't want to repeat it too, too, too much, but first, must we have to transform agro food systems for more efficient, more inclusive, and more uh, resilient. I always say resilient. When we look at the resilience, we need a more investment improve the infrastructure of agriculture, soil, land, water, and also the uh, uh, cold storage uh, and others. And also the research R&D investment. And second, I think also we should reduce food loss and the waste. Yeah, that's globally agreed. For the current loss and waste, can feed around 1.3 billion people per year. So, so I think we have to improve the uh, better and more efficient use of variable natural resources. Now we are focused on the fertilizer, but the water and land, we have to look at the global land use more properly. That's why the FO we can the one country, one commodity initiative. Of course, it's just the uh, uh, initiative, but of course it's a one plus A, yeah? Depend on the uh, countries. So, uh, and then we need more first policy that can increase the sustainable productivity. Because, Overall, agricultural productivity is low. They have a big potential, not only in the developed nation and in Europe, OECD members, they have big potential to improve their productivity. And last but not least, I think also we need a, a, a more transparent and coordination of global agricultural policy especially products policy, innovation policy, investment policy, and of course, trade policy. So for that, FO, we have to work together with all the uh, sister agencies like OCD and others, and also uh, to support members to transform agroforces on the ground. And after the UN Food Summit, if you know, we hosted the uh, coordination hub to follow up actions. And we need a more dialogue, build the ownership of partnership with members, and through the national dialogue, and, the, and also prioritize their pathways and their uh, 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 approaches. So I hope we can have uh, set some concrete action within next uh, months 
or one or two years, and then we need to think longer, five years or 10 years. Because it quite takes time, eh? especially look at the forestry and the soil has. We need the generations to, to, to continue. So thank you. And FAO is ready and willing to stress the cooperation with the OECD for the long-term commitment and for professionalism. That's our value. Yeah, otherwise, and we lose our ground. Thank you, over to you. Yes, if I could just respond also from an OECD perspective um, and to build on that very comprehensive um, answer that uh, the, the FAO gave. Of course, um, investments in innovation um, are really important, and we have recently la also launched another flagship publication that looks at the, our monitoring and evaluation numbers and the producer support, and we see um, sustained lower than um, desirable investment in this area. So we really need to amp up our spending in innovation and also on infrastructure in terms of supporting the use of new digital tools that we know um, uh, are being uh, used more and more, especially with the pandemic, and not just for producers, but also across value chains. So we need, we need to do new things, and we need to invest in doing new things, but we also need to think about doing things differently. Um, the, the FAO DG also mentioned thinking about uh, food systems and how complex that is, and in order to be able to build coherent policies and to have agriculture move in the direction we need it to move, we need to think about innovative public-private partnerships, we need to think about having silos cross government, um, have breaking those down so that there's better collaboration across government agencies. And we also need to think about how we collaborate across countries. So the OECD has been doing work in that area. We have networks where we bring together experts that work on food chain analysis or um, farm level analysis to try to learn from each other because only by learning are we going to be able to accelerate. And we also are have efforts bringing science um, together with policy in order to better inform policymakers' decisions. And we have a program called the Cooperative Research Program that works on that, where we try to make these linkages between science and policy so that better data and evidence can inform our policy choices. Leanne, thank, thank you very much. We have one more question on the climate change issue, um, and I think it's linked directly to this being an outlook. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the impact of climate change on our agricultural output for the outlook period? That's from uh, Anthony Rowley of the South China Morning Post. Maybe I can jump in quickly. I would guess that FAO may also have a response, but. Um, we know climate, climate has sort of two main impacts on agriculture. One is um, with, with kind of regular stress, it can affect yields. At the same time, it also is going to affect variability, and that's sort of the uncertainty that's built into our, built into our projections. So on the one hand, we do, um, based on our analysis and the consensus opinion of expert, global experts in these markets, we have um, assumptions around productivity, what we think that will look like in the future, that takes this um, into account. And then on the uncertainty, um, this is part of the discussion. We, we project trends, but we know that there will be variability around those trends, um, especially given the changing climate patterns. Thanks. Hello. Maybe I can give you a brief on that. Because uh, DDG Samad also, she is responsible for the issues, but the, uh, uh, I suspect very quick. And so that, if you have time to visit the FO web, because we put all our efforts and the strategies, action plans on FO. Since I come here, we start to say a digital FO. But first, climate change and the crisis hit the agriculture most. Yeah. Air culture here is include the car, animals, uh, forestry, and uh, fishery. So, and first we have we have to build up the resilient air culture, and and because uh, mitigate 
adapting the climate change. Second, we need also to uh, strengthen uh, 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 the capability, capacity for the farmers, for the rural areas to have a chance to produce more with less. Third, I think that also we, we encourage all the uh, OECD members to support most vulnerable members like seeds, small island development state, landlocked development countries, LDCs, LDCs, to support them to transform agro-food systems from the traditional to these science and innovation based agriculture. Because, and then we can uh, minimize uh, impact on the environment. And last but not least, we can encourage our members to open the market for the development nations and the, for their market accessibility. And last but not least, we need also help them to develop the digital agro food systems to help them to have a more efficient use of their products for marketing accessibility domestically and internationally. So let's build the sharing economy for the consumers. Best day, local comparable advantages. Last but not least, we need the innovation and the science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, I think with that, we're going to bring this uh, press conference and presentation of this year's Agricultural Outlook to a close. I'd like to thank all the participants and uh, remind everyone watching, you can find the information about today's event and about the report at uh, www.agri-outlook.org. Feel free to uh, consult that uh, reference. Uh, thank you very much to everyone, participants, and wish you all a very nice day.